I'm here today to talk to Ian Pimblett, who is Australia's leading cultural change agent. Ian, you've been a consultant working with organisations for over 20 years. I understand that most of your work has been focused on improving organisational culture. Can you tell me a little bit more about what organisational culture actually is? There are many textbooks that have many different uh, academic descriptions of what culture is, but I see it really simply as the way we do things. And it, it's like gravity, it's something that you can't see and you can't um, touch it, but it has an impact on you. So it has an impact on people in everything they do in life. So if you think about in your house, the way you were growing up, the way you were growing up, what was it like at dinner time? Did people talk to each other, share their stories, or was there silence? Did people go away and eat their meal by themselves? Was there hostility around the table? Those sorts of things are all about the culture of an organisation. Think about energy. Think about the energy that you have when you, say, go to a friend's house. Is it positive energy or is it negative energy? Does that energy help you feel comfortable to be with those people? Does it feel like you're under some sort of attack when you're with those people? That's what culture really is. It's the way we do things and the impact is how do people feel as a result of where the energy is going. How did you come to understand just how important culture is? The day I really understood the power and significance of culture started really badly for me. I had been hired to do the culture survey called the Organisational Culture Inventory and I had done that in the various places where they had offices. And on the day that I came back to Sydney to report to the board, I met the chief executive at eight o'clock in the morning. I was giving him the debrief of, of the results, and he's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met, and he didn't like what I was showing him. So for the next hour, he tore me to shreds and tried to undermine me, and I thought he's gonna sack me this afternoon in front of the board. So that took a little bit of uh, regrouping for me, and at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was uh, about to meet the board. And when the doors finally opened, I said to the HR manager who hired me, I said, thank you for having me, but I'm walking into the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to be sacked in front of the board. And that's the only way the chief executive can save face. But I'm going down with a fight. So about two minutes into my presentation, chief executive criticised my presentation and said that I was patronising the board. And I said, OK, let's cut straight to it. I don't know anything about your organisation. I haven't met any of your staff. I haven't seen any of your records. But I believe that you're burning your staff. Therefore, there's staff turnover too high. Your productivity is low. I think your customers must be very unhappy. And unless you've got a monopoly, your finances are a wreck. That was followed by a very large silence. I wasn't going to fill that silence and thankfully, in a short time, the person on my right who was a board member said yes, the next person said yes, the next person said yes, and the next person said yes. How did I know that is, is a good question. I had the survey which showed that the energy was being put into the wrong places. To the credit of everybody in that room, they agreed to put up a program to start the thing getting better. And a year later, I walked into the office and on the way I met one of the new team leaders and he said, have you got the results of the new survey back in? I said, yes. Uh, he said, they've got to improve. I said, why? He said, well, for the first time ever, one of our major customer service uh, communications has gone out on time, never happened before. That was the time that I really learned that I wanted to work with this thing called culture as my full-time occupation. I could see the power of it and I could see the influence it had on performance and people. I also learnt that leadership is the main issue in culture and culture is the major driver of performance and I wanted to be about that in my career. So you've guided organisations through the most significant cultural changes in Australia. Why were they so successful when I understand that more than half of them actually fail? Yes, sadly, we know that about 67% of people who use the human synergistics tools, which I believe are by far the best tools on the market, 67% still fail to get any statistically significant improvement in culture on the second measurement. 
And I think that there's a real problem in Australia that we, and probably around the world, that when people see that there's a, a task to be taken in terms of improving culture, there's a lot of activity, but it's without strategy. And I think one of the reasons that my, my clients have been so successful is that they have, from the very beginning, accepted my clear strategic path and they've gone along with that. And that's to their credit and that's why they've been so successful. I think it's very simple. I like to talk in very simple terms to my clients so that everybody in the organisation is clear about what we're talking about and what we need to do. I call it the top-down, bottom-up and make it personal strategy. Top-down, bottom-up, make it personal. What's that? I also believe in the philosophy that we are smarter than I am. So from the beginning, I encourage my clients and the ones who are highly successful take this up, that we are in this together and we have openness. We know what's going on, we include everybody. So the first thing that we do is use the OCI, the Organisational Culture Inventory Results. We take that to every team, we take it to the leaders, but we debrief every person in the organisation about the results of their team's culture, what other teams' cultures like in their own divisions and what's going on in the whole organisation. From the very beginning, I stand there in front of a group and listen to their questions. Sometimes they're very critical of why we're doing this. They don't understand it. They think it's a waste of time. But by the end of that session, once we've explained things carefully, listened to their questions, they're coming up with ideas for the whole organisation and for their own team. That is really critical. One of the next things I like to do is to engage the leaders. Leadership and culture are synonymous. You cannot have a good culture if you don't have a strong leadership team. So what we do is involve all of the leaders in 360 degree feedback, which is where they get uh, an image of themselves and they get an image of how people see them. And I do that for about two hours with each person and debrief them. At the end of one of those sessions, they'll come out, each person will come out with a plan on what they're going to do. Next critical stage of involvement is to get those people to share their results with their peers in their leadership teams. Now other people don't do that because it's a confidential tool. No one makes the people in my organisations have to share their results, but when we talk about it with them on what the benefits are, they come to the table often very nervously they do share their results and at the end of it, they say it's one of the best team building things we have ever done. And what I find is that those teams then start to take on about three months apart, their own sharing of the results and how they're going and giving each other feedback. So we're building the leadership team bit by bit around the 360 degree tools. Can't leave it at that. If we're going to be truly inclusive, we have to help the whole organisation know what the culture's about and what the behaviours are, and we need people to be able to understand that for themselves and come to their own thinking about whether their own behaviour is what it needs to be. So we run programs in the house, I call it Into the Blue, I run them, and we tell people about the circumplex, the measurement, and run activities, and we have a good fun time, but by the end of that, people have had a chance to really think about whether their behaviour is a bit too aggressive, a bit too passive, or where it's very constructive, and they have time to think more about their team. So they come away with more ideas on their team, how they might do better for their team's customers, how they might do better with neighbouring teams to improve processes, and each person has a chance to think about themselves. So I've done over 1,500 uh, debriefs around this um, LSI tool, Lifestyles Inventory, and every one of them is special. And what I find is more often than not, people want to come and have a second one in a year's time or two years time to see whether they've improved. And what we find is that most of the time our leaders improve. They're the sorts of things we need to do. But one of the things that really touches me after about the first year of that program is it's not just the managers who are on a journey, it's people everywhere. So I might be in a workshop where people are fixing things or I might be in an office and people will come up to me and they'll say quietly, Ian, mate, this is really helping me with my kids. This is really helping me at home. And when I hear those words, that's music to my ears, 
because I know that our culture program is inclusive, but it's comprehensive. It's not just me as a person at work, it's a benefit for me as the whole person. And I think that's what the basis of culture change has to be. And I think that a lot of organisations fail because they make it too complicated and they don't take it from top through to bottom. And often the leaders are the people who fail to listen to what the people are telling them. We are smarter than I am is a, is a life held belief of mine and I don't believe that that's embraced widely enough in a lot of organisations. That's why they fail. So it's very clear that your contribution to this field has been really impressive and really significant. So where to from here? It's been such a great privilege in my life to be given the opportunity to work in this area, to see culture and organisations improve and, and therefore the organisations improve and the performance improves and to see the impact that's had on people. That's been such a wonderful thing for me that I really want to, be sh want to share the experiences as much as I can with other people. I want to keep working with leaders. I want to help them understand and improve their capacity to help individuals and teams to take more control of their lives and, and the outcomes for the organisation. I also want to help organisations do the things that we need to do to be more successful and more sustainable. To me, that's really vital. When the culture improves, sustainability environmentally improves. That shouldn't be forgotten. A lot of people believe that you have productivity or you have sustainability. That is not true. The two are synonymous when the culture improves. So what I really want to do is get out there and meet with leaders and talk with people and share my eight key transformational strategies that I've developed over the years that I know work. I think they're the key that make uh, the organisation successful and I'd like to share that with people and see culture become a dominant talking point for organisations. Some key sporting teams have done that and they've been very successful. I don't think enough organisations A, take on what the culture's all about and B, understand how to do it and I'd like to fill some of that gap. Well, thank you very much for your time, Ian. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. For further information on Ian's work, please visit his website. <music>